All right, so for the recording and anybody else who is watching this out there, this is our final installment of our Food Cycle series in 2022. I'm Nora Melli, I'm the Education Manager for the Delaware Center for Horticulture. Um, this series was uh, grant funded by DENREC, the Delaware um, Natural Resources and Environmental uh, Council. Um, and they've given it to us because food waste is such a huge problem in Delaware. Um, tonight, we have our final speaker who is Stacy Savage. Stacy is zooming in from Texas um, where she's used to this heat that we are experiencing today. Um, and she's got some personal experience um, that have driven her to a path in, um, in protecting the planet. Um, she's been a recycling nerd for a long time. Um, and she's done a lot of statewide, Texas statewide legislation. Um, and she has been involved in, in a bunch of different things out there. Uh, she is here today to talk to us about uh, local waste recycling, um, composting, zero waste strategies, a whole realm of important topics. Um, and so without further ado, I'm gonna pass it over to you, Stacy. All right, great. Well, thank you uh, so much, Nora. I appreciate the introduction. Um, I'm Stacy Savage. I am from the great state of Texas, born and raised. Uh, yes, we are dealing with a lot of heat and humidity, um, you know, and uh, we're used to it down here, but not so much there in, in uh, Delaware. Uh, so I feel your pain. Um, we're going to go ahead and just get started, uh, you know, with the, kind of an agenda around uh, laying out some basic topics, some basic ideas and concepts around zero waste. And then we're gonna really get into the, the kind of nitty gritty of what people can do at home and at work. Um, so let me go ahead and uh, I'll share my screen here and we'll go ahead and get started with the presentation. Can everybody see that? I hope so. <laughs> Looks great. Okay, good. Um, so, uh, you know, zero waste strategies, we're an environmental non, or excuse me, not a nonprofit, but <laughs> zero waste strategies is an environmental consulting firm um, that works with businesses, local governments, institutions to help them reduce waste to drive increased revenue, deeper customer loyalty, employee empowerment around these issues, as well as uh, to drive a green marketing edge over the competition. So um, our company has worked with renowned uh, companies across the world, such as Dell, uh, Nestle, Purina, AT&T, Kohler, the city of Austin, Belden, the Meadows Foundation, which is a nonprofit, um, several hotels and apartments uh, that, that uh, hold multiple, multiple families that manage a lot of waste. Um, helping them really dial in their, their uh, waste issues and helping educate their tenants uh, as well. So um, what do we need, mean by zero waste? Well, we have to first take a look at what our current production system really looks like, and it's very linear. What that means is that will extract natural resources. So you can see the logging industry, the crude oil industry and refinement and um, plants. Uh, you can see, see that uh, they produce, um, you know, like a, uh, like a refinery would, would produce crude oil into uh, gasoline and plastics and, and that type of thing. So there's a production mechanism around that. And then you look at the trucking industry the transportation where it distributes out to the general public, the consumers um, and business consumers, those products that were uh, produced at those plants. And then you can see where those consumers can just buy them up off the shelves at your uh, local hardware store or your, your big box store. Uh, maybe it's a local mom and pop, but it had to get to your store shelf some, somehow, right? And then um, once, once items are either you know, just not usable anymore. They are maybe old, they're brittle, they cracked, they are obsolete. Think electronics here um, and software programs, hardware. Uh, a lot of times they'll just hit the landfill. And so it goes from the ground, uh, you know, through the extraction process 
moves through the purchasing process. And then once you're done with it, it goes into the dump or like an incineration process the majority of the time. Uh, so that's very linear. Now, what we mean by zero waste is let's connect the two ends and make them a loop. Let's close the loop. And globally, zero waste is defined as a goal of 90% or more waste reduction from landfills and incinerators by 2040 or even sooner. So if we can do 95, 99% by 2030, great. Um, but that, you know, that 90 by 2040 is the goal. So keep that in mind as we move forward. Uh, the zero waste system, as you can see here, uh, includes a lot more than the linear system because you're talking about policy at the local and state level, even the federal level. Uh, we have uh, Rep Representative Ilhan Omar has introduced the Federal Zero Waste uh, Act, which would be an economic driver and really promote zero waste activity around what's happening in uh, landfills and incineration uh, facilities all across the US and really keeping valuable usable material out of those facilities and putting them back into this loop for remanufacturing, refurbishment, repair, uh, those, those types of uh, industries uh, so that we're giving these extra items or, or we're giving these items extra lives um, past their initial use. So we gotta change the rules, we gotta shift the subsidies uh, really create jobs, um, and, and uh, you know that comes through the entire production process. It comes to the distribution process, um, making sure that uh, consumers are empowered around their purchasing decisions, uh, and then going into the recycling and recovery phase. In the bottom left hand, that you can see there with the broken computer, producer responsibility is a huge cog in the zero waste system. Um, Back in 2007, uh, a nonprofit that I worked for, we passed the state's, uh, the state of Texas uh, computer take back and recycling law that required manufacturers are responsible for their old and obsolete electronics. Um, so they have free take back and responsible recycling for Texans statewide. Uh, we repeated that victory in 2011 and got the television manufacturers on the hook for their own materials, uh, their own items, when they're old, broken, or obsolete, take them back, recycle them responsibly for Texans for free. I think there's about 26 other states that have take back legislation on the books already. Um, and then, uh, you know, this that take back um, concept can be extended to the producers of batteries and light bulbs and tires. Um, you know, there's all sorts of different products that would typically end up mattresses even, that would typically just end up in our landfills, bulking them up, right? Taking up all the room in the landfill. These are bulky items most of the time. And, uh, you know, keeping those out of landfill and having the manufacturer take back and responsibly recycle uh, for their consumers. And then of course, like I said earlier, um, producing jobs, green jobs with dignity. So we're gonna move on. So <laughs> what is a waste, what is zero waste? Uh, why is it important? Um, another kind of visual definition here is that the waste berg, uh, if you think about it, the waste that you see out at the curb is just the tip of the waste berg because for every pound that's in your trash can, 71 pounds of materials were used to produce that one pound upstream at some point. So landfills are one of the largest sources of greenhouse gas emissions worldwide. Um, methane from organic waste, which we're talking about today, that food waste um, and yard clippings, landscaping, that type of thing, is, uh, you know, the, the methane from that uh, organic breakdown of that putrescible waste is 21 to 72 times more potent than carbon dioxide. And if we had a 90% reduction and we actually met that zero waste goal, that would be equal to removing 21% of all U.S. coal-fired power plants uh, annually. So let's talk about and really get into the, the deep dive of what is organic waste. It's really anything that comes from plants or animals. So you can see here on the curb, there's a lot of yard waste, but what is also uh, noticeable is that the yard waste is in a paper bag. So all of that is compostable. If it's in a plastic bag, not so much. 
Uh, you can see on the right hand side, we're also talking about food scraps. So fruit and veggie peels, of course, bones, shells, meat, dairy, paper towels, yard clippings, manure, all this stuff is uh, all organic, can be broken down in a proper compost system. So if you go way, way, way back uh, since the depression era, food waste has been a major, major concern. You can see these old type of posters that would be kind of glued up on, you know, buildings or, or you know, bulletin boards all across cities, you know, in the U.S. that says don't waste food. You, you know, if you buy it, you got to cook it, you got to serve it, you got to save what you can eat before it gets spoiled and always, you know, homegrown is best. So there's always been this message since the Depression era in the early 1900s of reducing food waste nationally. Um, and taking these, these kinds of measures that are supported by um, you know, the federal government. And uh, so this is something that I think we've kind of gotten away from in recent decades. Um, and you know, this is something that we're really looking to, um, I guess, recapture as a society uh, to, to make sure that uh, we're not only using what we buy, but really focusing on kind of that locally grown, that homegrown feel um, and, and uh, supporting local economies as well with, with food purchases. Uh, so buckle up because you're about to experience some pretty shocking statistics on food waste. Uh, so as you guys know, I'm from Texas here in the Austin area. Uh, the city of Austin back in 2015 conducted a community-wide waste diversion study. And about 37% of the materials that they found in the entire waste stream of that study was organic material. So that would be that food waste, um, pizza boxes, the paper towels, uh, and, and uh, leaves and brush and grass clippings and that type of thing. So uh, the national average is 30, 40. 30 to 40 percent. That's from the, U, the US EPA. So you can see that the city of Austin is kind of right there in the middle. I believe they just did another 2020, 2021 study and that the results of that will be uh, released to the public soon. So we're going to be able to benchmark um, every five year increments to see how we're doing on these different types of, uh, of materials. And if you can see everything from paper to plastic metal, glass, um, you know, the 18% down here and the, the reusable and recoverable, everything um, that is, is uh, shown here could have been, uh, was either recycled um, or could have been recycled, uh, you know, as far as the uh, things like paper and plastic, but also could have been composted as well. So you can see uh, here that 81% of this graph could have been uh, or should have been uh, handled <laughs> properly. Uh, so moving on. And so 25% of our fresh water supply is used to produce food that's actually wasted. So if you think about uh, buying that box of strawberries and it gets too old, it gets moldy in the back, you never saw it, it's been a month and you're like, oh man, now I gotta throw it out. Uh, that you, you, pay for it twice, basically. You pay for it up front, buying it from the store, and then you pay for it through your hauler services to get that, you know, off of your property. So that's a, you know, a, a secondary way that we're kind of wasting money there. Um, not only that, keeping in mind with that freshwater supply, inside of the 1.3 billion tons of food that's wasted every year worldwide, there are 43 trillion gallons of water that's wasted worldwide. Um, so yeah, I, I know it's very shocking. Um, so just keep that in, in mind uh, that it takes a lot of water to produce the food that we're actually throwing in the trash. <laughs> so, um, and then uh, another statistic is the amount of food wasted in the US each day would fill the Rose Bowl Stadium. That represents $165 billion a year in wasted food. Now we do need to address organic waste around the COVID epidemic. Uh, before coronavirus, uh, there was about 35 million people who were struggling with hunger in the US and about 10 million of those were children. 
now more than 54 million people, including 18 million children, may experience food insecurity. Um, so the US EPA has put out the food recovery hierarchy. And what this means is that there is a top to bottom preferred, most preferred to least preferred set of goals or set of steps to use in order to uh, properly handle excess food. So if you look at the top, we're talking about waste, or excuse me, source reduction. Um, what that means is that you are, and this is especially helpful for businesses, you probably already have that kind of food rotation, first in, first out, dating your food whenever it comes in from the supplier, making sure that you've got your inventory spot on and you're only ordering what you actually need. That's gonna help you reduce your uh, source of food waste from the get-go. Um, another one is feeding hungry people in our community. Uh, businesses that hold a food permit are legally allowed to donate food. It is a misnomer that you are legally liable if somebody gets sick because you have donated food from your facility. And this goes this is, uh, through the, the Federal uh, Good Samaritan Act, and we'll get to that here in a moment. Um, so as, uh, the third is to feed hungry animals. So working with local farmers and ranchers to divert that uh, material that's no longer consumable by humans, but still consumable by animals. Uh, you can use that as feed with ranchers. And then farmers can take the, the food waste and make it into their own compost on site at their farm and then use that to nourish their, their crops and amend the soil. The next one is industrial uses. So we're talking about um, uh, you know, beautification where uh, erosion control cities and municipalities can use uh, this kind of compost and, and mulching uh, products to uh, beautify roadways and medians and also to reduce erosion. And then uh, it can also be used in biofuels. There are uh, several biofuel locations, at least here in Austin, I, that uh, where you can um, you can take a, a diesel car and you don't really need any modifications. You have a diesel car, you can pull up to a biofuels pump and and get uh, this is like yellow grease, right? That you would collect from uh, restaurants or or a fast food place where they have a lot of yellow grease fats and oils. Um, that usually is, is sucked out from a, a trap, from a grease trap, and it can be refined and getting all the particles out in order to make it into a biofuel. Um, next to last is composting. So you see how composting comes in at the very bottom. We wanna use all these um, methods above that before composting even comes into play. Uh, now composting, of course, is when you fold in the, the dry, um, organic material like your leaves and uh, yard trimmings and, and uh, shrub cuttings and grass clippings and all, you mix that in with your wet or food waste. So your vegetable peels, um, your coffee grounds, your eggshells, um, and you mix that all in and, and uh, you get a nitrogen rich and carbon mix, uh, nitrogen and carbon, carbon rich mixture uh, that kind of resembles a chocolate cake. The crumbly chocolate cake. Um, if if you uh, if you do it correctly, uh, if you're doing it correctly and you've got your nice balance, that means that there is low odor and there are um, there's uh, really not much to attract rodents or uh, you know flying insects. And then of course you've got your incineration or landfill. So burning and burying is uh, not considered a zero waste method it is considered a disposal method. So all of these, um, you know, composting and above, this is all diversion, uh, landfill and incineration is disposal. So those are very, very two different, um, you know, kinds of industries. So I'll move on here. So uh, reducing food waste, we can do this in our everyday activities. Um, one, like we said, homegrown, local grown is uh, really the, the best place to be most sustainable. You can provide uh, instant access to your, your family or your neighbors, um, doing a, a little community garden or whatnot, uh, provides that instant, ac instant access to seasonal herbs and, and uh, produce. 
Uh, it's a really good learning experience and bonding experience uh, to do that with your uh, kids or grandkids, even owners of businesses that have employees that want to tend the garden and kind of do a little stress relief out in, in nature. Um, any excess uh, that, that you do have left over, you can either donate it to your neighbors or you can can it uh, for, for next year. And um, you know, businesses can, can uh, work with local food banks as well if they've got uh, these, these kinds of um, uh, fresh picked produce that they want to, to give away. And then any of the food waste that's not used, um, all of the uh, you know, clipping off the, the dead leaves and all of that becomes part of your compost mixture for next year, for the next growing season. So you can really look into um, two examples in the Austin area, at least, is Hillside Pharmacy, um, where they get their, their produce, and then Boggy Creek Farms. Uh, so those are two that you can look into about how they really do it on site um, and how it's really beneficial to the community. These are two very, very popular um, places to go for either fresh produce or to um, have your own plot where you can grow your own food. Um, and it's a community garden. So this is really important for not only business owners that have a food permit, but also people at home. Uh, this is what I like to call the grocery cycle, and this is your in and out. So starting in the top left, we really want to take inventory of food stocks, whether you're at home or at a restaurant, uh, take inventory of what you already have on hand, what you want to cook for the week, and then what you need to purchase. Uh, you'll definitely want to re research and utilize what you already have on hand. You're going to want to make recipes that surround or revolve around what's already on hand. Um, that way you're utilizing, uh, you know, materials that may be on the brink of spoilage, but not yet. And if you use that box of tomatoes that has not spoiled yet, just yet, um, but might in the next, you know, two days, then you have saved yourself, um, you know, the, the food. So you don't have to go back and purchase more tomatoes, but you've also saved it from landfill and where you don't have to pay for it to be hauled away. So you're, you're really optimizing the original purchase of that box of tomatoes. Um, allow chefs really some autonomy and flexibility in the kitchen for your daily menus. They're the ones who know exactly what's on hand, what's in the inventory, what needs to be purchased, um, and, and how to make the recipes uh, smartly around what's, what you already have and what's about to spoil, what may be expiring soon. Allowing them that autonomy uh, allows you to um, really maximize your, your profit, maximize your purchases. Um, another way to maximize purchases is bulk. So of course, you know, grains and pastas, your beans, uh, your dry goods, getting those in bulk is really important. Um, that way you're cutting down on packaging as well. Uh, of course, really stocking up on things like meats and frozen veggies. If you have a deep freeze, you know, this is a, a great time to, to go ahead and stock up and uh, get those things on ice because, uh, you know, you're, you're never going to know when, when the supply chain, you know, at least these days, when the supply chain may um, not be as supportive as it is right now to our daily lives and our daily consumption habits. Uh, so another thing is food rotation. Like I said, first in, first out. We call that FIFO. And uh, making sure that, you know, the orders that you get from your maybe produce and protein suppliers, that those come in and they get dated properly. And then those are the first things that get used the next week um, so that you're not using, you know, that you're not getting the dates all mixed up and that you're, you're not potentially sending out food um, that, that may be, um, you know, already expired. So thinking of smaller purchases more frequently throughout the week is another way to really reduce that, that grocery cycle um, or to optimize your grocery cycle. And what I mean by that is, you know, especially today, these days where you can have someone drop off your groceries, they can do the shopping for you, or you go pick them up. Uh, you've got a delivery schedule. You can do a lot smaller purchases more frequently. Um, and this is really especially helpful for folks at home. That way you're not, um, you don't have a lot of food to go through before it spoils. You can 
uh, go through the smaller amounts that you have and then just place a new order uh, for things that you may need. So, um, you know, that's something to, to keep in mind. You don't have to go out and do grand $400 purchases uh, every week. You could do, um, you know, $200 purchases a couple of times a week and, and make them smaller and make sure that the food lasts um, a little bit longer, that you're going through everything that you possibly can um, before it spoils. Um, another way is to reuse your scraps for maybe stocks, soups, sauces. Um, a great way to do this is to uh, take your, you know, your carrot tops and your tomato tops and your, you know, uh, potato peels and put everything in a Ziploc bag, throw it in the freezer. And the next time that you're ready to make a chicken noodle soup, well, you've got the stock ready to go. You just put all that in boiling water. Um, let it simmer down for a couple of hours and, and you know, you're ready to, to drain all that out and uh, put your ingredients in for your, for your soup. Uh, my husband has a, um, a, well, we call it famous, a famous uh, family recipe where we do a, a turkey soup every year. Um, after Thanksgiving, we will uh, freeze the carcass of the turkey and whatever we didn't use, then we'll debone the turkey and um, boil that down and make it make a turkey soup stock uh, before we get rid of the, the carcass. So we give it an extra life and it makes gallons and gallons of, of really delicious uh, turkey stock so that we can make our, our soup. We put barley and, and carrots and celery and onions and all the types of good stuff in there. So, um, and, and you know, we'll have that for, uh, for Christmas, part of our Christmas dinner. So it's, uh, it's just a, a couple of things to think about. Um, regarding reuse in the kitchen. And then of course, donating non-perishable items for, for good. Uh, that would be something that people can do at the home level and uh, donating canned goods, right? Uh, boxes of crackers, that kind of thing, things that aren't gonna perish. But also if you're a business, uh, being able to take um, advantage of the Good Samaritan Act that we'll cover here in just a little bit, that allows you to partner with local nonprofits in your area that do food redistribution from those donations. So moving on. Um, so we wanna you know, really talk about composting of food waste. Now, there's a big difference here. I, really, I wanna make sure that folks understand if you have a home composting system, like a tumbler or you know, a little um, hole in the ground and you take a pitchfork and you turn it you know, every couple of days or whatnot, that's great. Uh, that is that is wonderful. Um, if you're going to be just dealing with your fruit and veggie peels, your ground coffee grounds, your your cracked uh, eggshells or whatnot, but it that cannot get hot enough in order to produce something or to uh, break down something like meat bones and dairy. So if you have a curbside composting pickup where an industrial compost hauler comes and picks up your curb organics that you put into the, you know, the bin, then most likely they'll be able to take meat, bone, and dairy um, shells, that kind of thing. So if your home composter is great for everything else but meat, bone, and dairy. So just keep that in mind. And then if you're, um, if you have an industrial hauler, or you take your organics to an industrial place that has, a, you know, um, the, the facility to, to take something like meat, bun, and dairy, you want to ask them first because there are some composters out there that have a huge industrial facility, but they won't take meat, bun, and dairy. So you don't want to contaminate the rest of their compostable materials with, um, you know, items that you may have misplaced into the composting bin accidentally, or you just didn't know. So another way to compost, uh, considering that we're talking to um, you know, uh, an organization like, like yours, uh, consider on-site composting. This is what I was talking about whenever you've got kind of like the, the um, in the ground system, or you can do some kind of like three bin system where they're, um, you know, your, your food scraps and your, your dry um, yard waste is kind of separated. And then in the third bin, you kind of do the mixing and you've got the, the natural uh, uh, carbon and nitrogen mixture uh, that start to balance each other out. And then of course you can concern, you can consider uh, vermicomposting where you let earthworms and other types of worms um, do their thing. 
and break it all down for you. Yes, you can actually go and buy red wigglers. Um, these earthworms are fantastic. They are, um, they're really uh, our, our composting champions. Uh, so there's another way that you can do the, you know, handle food waste that's not composting is to biodigest. Um, so with a, an, with a, a system like this, uh, you can put food waste in. Uh, this company has proprietary microbes and that kind of break everything down. And within a 24 hour period, what you're getting is gray water out the other side that taps into the municipal uh, drain system. So this would be really good for a back of the house kitchen at a restaurant, a hotel um, restaurant, a hospital, um, you know, eatery, um, you know, anywhere that has like an employee cafeteria, something like that, that's a little bigger that you're going to be producing a lot more food, food waste. This would be able to also take meat, bone, and dairy. So food waste goes in, microbes do their thing, and then gray water comes out, dumps into the purple pipe system of your local municipality. So it's kind of like water reclamation for the city. Uh, so you're adding to that, that water conservation effort. So we're going to do a little test your knowledge on composting um, and you can just type in true or false or T or F in the chat box and then we'll just have um, the moderator go ahead and uh, uh, read off the, uh, the answers to see. Uh, you don't have to put any names with the answers, but um, this way we can we can just uh, do a little fun test here. So. I'm gonna give you about five seconds to answer and then we'll reveal the answer. So paper hand towels, this is the statement. Paper hand towels can be recycled, but not composted, true or false? Well, we're gonna give it a second for anyone to type in. Uh, we got a false. Okay. Um, I think paper, towel, paper hand towels can be recycled, but not composted. I think I agree with that false. All right, here we go. It's false. Um, and here's the reason, the reason why uh, paper hand washing towels should never be recycled. Um, so in things like office paper, you've got really long threads of fibers and uh, that is really highly valuable to recyclers. Now the really short paper, the short fibers in paper towels um, and newspapers really kind of just been down cycled from, um, from paper that had longer strips of, or longer threads of, of fibers. And so the more and the more that they get down cycled, they're just too short to have really any value for a recycling processor. However, they're really excellent for composting as they bring kind of that dry, that uh, dry mix to the wet food materials. So it helps balance that out. Um, so this would be really good to have these at your hand washing stations in hospitals, uh, back of the house restaurants, in your restrooms as well, in you know, hotels, apartment complexes, wherever um, you can think of that, that uh, would be um, a wash room situation, hand washing station situation it, to open to the public or to your employees. So the next statement is industrial compost facilities can process meat, bone and dairy. All right, so we're waiting for another answer to come in. Let's see y'all. <laughs> well, I'm, while we're waiting, mm -hmm. I'm gonna say, I think it is true. Okay. Answer uh, is and true. And we got a true for some kinds. All yeah. right. <laughs> All right. Yeah, so just like we said earlier, your home side yard composter is not the place for meat, bone, and dairy. It doesn't get hot enough. Um, the, the bacteria just doesn't um, get agitated enough. But um, if your city offers curbside compost, pick up for your business or your, your, you know, your home, um, it's likely that that program will allow meat, bone, and dairy. You definitely want to um, either check with the city or your hauler first to make sure um, but, you know, the, the industrial facility is going to um, be able to produce those extremely high temperatures needed to break down these, um, 
these tougher protein-based food waste categories. Um, so again, you know, don't, don't put meat, bone, and dairy in your backyard compost and just doesn't get hot enough. So I think we've all taken that away. Um, so <laughs> my, uh, my 1980s babies will, <laughs> will get this and uh, be very appreciative. So compost attracts rodents. Um, if you're not familiar with The Princess Bride, I highly recommend you watch it like 20 times. <laughs> Great movie. It is. Uh, so the statement is compost attracts rodents. The answer is false uh, with some caveats ish. <laughs> So let's go through those. It's mostly false. So if you're correctly balancing the percentage of dry materials that produce carbon and nitrogen with your yard, yard waste, with your wet materials that provide liquid, like your food waste, you won't get a sludgy material that will smell. But you're going to get, like I said, that dark, dense, really power packed soil amendment that crumbles like chocolate cake. Um, otherwise, you could get visitors like rodents, raccoons, flies. Um, and then the compost bins should have very tight lids that you can either screw on or clamp down. Um, that way we can, <laughs> your rodents will be hashtag outsmarted. <laughs> Next up, we're gonna get into hacks for reducing food waste. Let's go to the kitchen. This is huge. So we really need to hammer down on this, the use by versus the sell by versus the best by date. What's the difference? Um, so let me tell you, this has been something that has been plaguing customers for years and years, for decades even. The dates are labeled on the food products by the manufacturer, not the government. It is not consistent. So the dates really point to the manufacturer's uh, peak freshness of that product. And that's when they want to use it. That's when they want you to use it by. And when the quality of the product starts declining and you go past that date that the manufacturer stopped, stamped on there, not the government, um, then that is their, you know, their window of saying, okay, you're not, a, you're not gonna get the peak freshness if you go past this date. Uh, the dates don't really have anything to do with food spoilage. Um, and then the really the only thing that's regulated is baby formula. There's really no other requirement by the FDA for expiration dates on food. And then uh, now, though, the, there's been a lot of uh, pushback from consumer groups um, and even packaging groups, product packaging groups for food, food based products. So, you know, the, the Food and Drug Administration is now kind of supporting an industry led effort to reduce that confusion among consumers with a much more consistent best if used by date. So we will see how that comes about, but um, it's, it's important to um, really, you know, you, you definitely wanna use by, you know, before anything spoils, of course, but for now, since it's so confusing, just you, you don't necessarily have to throw it out if it's past the date. So, just because the date says one thing doesn't mean the food is bad. It just means that you're past the peak freshness and then the quality starts to decline um, based on the testing from the company that produced the actual food um, that's in the box or in the packaging or, or whatnot. So um, I see a lot of people say, oh, you know, I'll give this away for free, but it's, it goes bad tomorrow. And I'm like, no, 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 that's, that's not what that means. So there's a lot of education and a lot of deconfusing that needs to happen around this. But I think the FDA getting into um, the thick of it and helping kind of hammer out those, those inconsistencies are going to be very beneficial for all of us as consumers and help us all reduce our food waste to landfill. So uh, this is really great for businesses, making sure that your uh, temperatures are properly held in your appliances. So if you have a kitchen, uh, a commercial kitchen, you've got walk-in refrigerators, you've got walk-in freezers, you've got reach and deep freezers. Um, these are things where you wanna, you wanna really keep uh, those appliances at the correct temperatures. And this is in Fahrenheit. Um, so your walk-ins at 35 to 38, walk-in freezers zero to negative 10, and your reach in freezers five to, to negative 10 degrees. Um, so obviously prevention is always going to be cheapest 
uh, whenever you keep things maintained at the proper temperature and you don't let your appliances uh, you know, break down, that you've got proper maintenance schedules, that kind of thing, that's your prevention piece. And then uh, this is gonna aid in reducing strains of spoilage mold, foodborne and bacterial pathogens, uh, things that can get actually get people sick. Uh, so these are the things you really want to think about if you have a food permit and um, uh, you, you're not so uh, thrilled about repairing um, your, your refrigerator that is uh, operating at uh, 45 degrees <laughs> instead of 35 degrees. There's a, you know, there's a big difference there and it, and it all hinges around public safety. So uh, please invest in your appliance uh, maintenance. So uh, let's talk about food reuse and repurposing. This is one of that kind of hierarchy through the uh, EPA that we talked about. Repurposing and reuse is one of those uh, where reuse, you know, you can really have a field day with, with leftovers. You can, um, you know, let's say you've got a uh, loaf of bread. It will probably, it's maybe two days old, but it's, it's still consumable. Uh, chop it down and bake it and, and you know, make it into uh, croutons or turn it into bread pudding. Um, there's, there's all kinds of things that you can do with something like that. You can do the same thing with rice. You can do the same thing with um, you know, half cut fruits. You can put them into a smoothie instead of, of, uh, of throwing them away. So definitely you know, making sure that there's a reuse and repurposing is at front of the mind. Um, and then of course, we've got the legally donate or legal donations to local food banks. So we'll get to that, to that here. Um, so you'll see that the, the federal, uh, it's called the, the Federal uh, Bill Emerson, Good Samaritan Food Donation Act of 1996. So yes, you have been able to donate food legally since 1996. Again, a lot of companies still think that they're on the hook financially and legally if something happens to someone who eats a, um, a meal or whatnot from a food donation. Not the case, you are legally protected because you provided that in good faith. You've kept it to proper time and temperature uh, standards through your, through your state's health code, your health department. And you have also given it to a group that specializes in food donations. So, you know, you've got the, the Food Bank of Delaware here in, you know, you've got Feeding America branches all over the country. Uh, you've got state um, branches and uh, you usually have county food banks that specialize in feeding hungry people. They will take those donations. The only thing that you really need to do is to make sure that the transport is consistent so that you're on like a, a weekly or every other week schedule and they'll come out with their big trucks, take your food donation, they'll give you a manifest and it's really important to uh, write down or keep track of maybe on a, a digital spreadsheet where how much you donated, what you donated, how much the fair market price value would have been um, if you used it in your business, um, the date, who it went to, that kind of thing. That way you can uh, tack it on to your taxes and you actually get a 15% fair market value rebate on your business taxes, not for everyday people that don't have a food permit, but your business taxes, you can get a 15% um, tax deduction or rebate uh, if you've got that proper uh, documentation. So uh, let's see, moving, oh, uh, moving on to the holiday food waste. We all know that holiday food waste is the main time of the year whenever our waste increase just skyrockets through the roof. Um, not only in our consumer habits of, you know, Christmas gifts and, and wrapping paper and, and packaging and your Amazon deliveries and all of that, but also we got to really look at the food aspect of this. Um, whenever we have large people, well, over the last two years with COVID, it was not, you know, a lot, but pre-COVID and, and, you know, moving on from here on out, uh, most people are gathering for the holidays. Uh, so it's important to really understand how we can reduce food around these large gatherings. So at least around Thanksgiving, we can uh, stop wasting pumpkins. You know, people buy these uh, for Halloween and then that moves into the fall decorations and we put it out on the front porch and we've got the, the carbon contests and, you know, 
these are things that are actual, they're edible. And so uh, this is something that where, you know, you can buy a, a pumpkin and you can literally make uh, candies and smoothies out of the, the uh, internal flesh. There's recipes that you can find online. Um, you can use the innards of these gourds to make a, a veggie broth. Um, you can throw a smash party and compost it. You can throw it, you know, to where, you know, maybe uh, some, some uh, wilder areas, maybe in your community to where the wildlife will come in and eat it. Uh, there's all kinds of different things that can, can happen with, with these types of things that we would normally just see as decoration. Um, but they're actually, you know, things that we can eat, um, that we can feed wildlife with, that we can make other decorations. Uh, so just another couple of things to think about around, uh, the Halloween and, and, um, Thanksgiving times. So in 2016, nearly 6 million turkeys wound up in the trash during the holiday season, um, according to the NRDC. So like I said earlier, we debone turkeys, boil them down, uh, create that soup stock and freeze it for later, make a, make a turkey soup. Uh, this is a really great way to, um, you know, give the the carcass another life and to really build out another uh, vat, <laughs> I guess you could call it, of, of uh, um, broth in order to make different types of soups and sauces and that type of thing. So, um, you know, just thinking of ways that you can either reduce or reuse, repurpose uh, these, these foods is going to be really critical, um, you know, as we keep getting more food in the landfill and we, and we, we are, have these uh, methane and carbon dioxide uh, releases from these landfills. They're one of the, the top you know, five greenhouse gas emitters in the country is uh, landfills. And it's because food waste is in there. It's because uh, these, these organic materials are, are uh, decomposing. So anything that we can do to, to stop that process, even on a local level, or a business level where you're even taking stronger green leadership within your business that you're showing your employees, hey, we care about food waste. Um, we're donating this, this, and this uh, every year or every month. Uh, we're working with this food bank. It really builds that camaraderie. It builds up the boost uh, in morale among employees thinking, you know, I work for a company that really cares about the hungry people in our community. They're doing this, this, and this to make sure that consumable food doesn't hit the, the landfill. So it really allows um, more worker pride when they when you start to tell those green stories, not only to your employees, but to your consumer base as well. Uh, that's a green marketing story that can be put into play very easily. So at home, I've got a couple of tech options for you guys. These are really great. Uh, choose my plate. This is a really wonderful way to um, find recipes that repurpose different kinds of foods up to five different ways. So you can learn how to repurpose yogurt. You can learn how to repurpose carrots. They've got all these different little posters where, you know, and, and small written out instructions on how to repurpose foods in your own home. Um, and so it will give proper nutrition um, uh, indications for, you know, age and weight and height and all, but it really provides that food guide uh, for all levels of health and helps you uh, get creative in the kitchen. The next one, I absolutely, I love, I love this one. Uh, download the Food Keeper app. Uh, it helps you understand the proper food and beverage storage to maximize the freshness and quality of items. So how do you store, um, you know, beef properly? How do you store blackberries properly? How do you store potatoes properly? If we're improper storage helps foster that food waste um, conundrum uh, that we're in. So sometimes we're, we're just not storing it properly and it spoils. So the Food Keeper app allows you to understand how to uh, take the things that are already in your refrigerator or that you're bringing home from the grocery store and store it properly. Uh, so this was an app that was developed by the USDA Cornell University, the Food Marketing Institute. So if you go to foodsafety.gov, you'll be able to find that and download it. This is my, by far my favorite uh, app. This piece of technology is just brilliant. It's the Guestimator app. 
and it allows you to find, you know, to type in how many people are actually going to be at your gathering. And then it tells you how to, how much food to make so that you're not over preparing. So it gives you money saving tips, how to, how to freeze foods properly, uh, ways to revive food that has been frozen uh, properly as well so that you don't, you know, um, promote bacteria growth. The guesstimator app really allows you to calculate how much food you don't need to prepare. Uh, and so that way you can, you can get through it all without having to send people home with loads and loads of Tupperware of, of uh, food leftovers <laughs> or to have them all stacked up in your own refrigerator and you have to spend the next week making turkey sandwiches. Um, so really want everybody to kind of learn at their own pace. There's some resources here where you can go to the Zero Waste International Alliance. And this is the group that has uh, really put together all of the terms, the definitions, the standards for both businesses and communities around zero waste. They're the ones that came up that 90% by 2040 goal. Uh, that's these guys. Uh, the U.S. Green Building Council is really, um, talks about energy and water conservation in the built space uh, of, of across America. So think about your office spaces, your medical institutions, your college campuses, your apartment and condos, you know, are, if they're LEED certified, then that means that they have been through the, the uh, energy and water um, reduction and conservation uh, certification process. But a couple of years ago, the U.S. Green Building Council also folded in zero waste protocols into their certification process. So that means you're, you can get extra points, right? You can get a level higher um, if you are able to fold in zero waste strategies and uh, protocols into your lead certifications. Um, also the Ellen MacArthur Foundation is wonderful. They've, they've got a, a very large uh, platform that talks about circular economy. Um, remember we talked about the linear economy at the very beginning where you have extraction, production, transportation, consumption, and dumping. Um, the circular economy really takes those two ends and ties them together, closes the loop. Zero waste just happens to be a cog in the entire circular economy. So it's just a piece of it. There's a lot more to it. So you can find out more about that at the Ellen MacArthur Foundation. I've got everything linked here. Five Gyres Institute, uh, they're another great organization. They really track the five or the swirling gyres of plastic debris in all of our oceans. Um, there's one called the Great Pacific Garbage Patch that is five times the size of New Zealand. So just kind of trying to wrap your mind around that. Um, and there's one in every ocean. So they kind of keep, keep track of what's, what's going on with that. Um, and then the Story of Stuff project is really great for kids. I absolutely love these guys. Story of Stuff um, uses cartoon vignettes uh, to explain very difficult concepts in a very simple way. And it's very entertaining, really cute, very well narrated. Um, and I think it really um, helps kids understand what they can do, and then also what the what the real problem is. So we don't kind of sugarcoat it for them. They definitely need to know because they are the ones that are uh, unfortunately being handed these problems. Uh, so I just want to let folks know that if you are a business owner, we do have our new six week online training program for business executives, entrepreneurs, and managers. I personally take you through the entire process. So we have training videos, educational resources. We got your checklists, your worksheets. You get on a support call with a group of our, our enrolled businesses. And um, we talk through the headaches together. There's private one-on-one -on -one consultation where you sit down with me either on a Zoom call or over coffee um, or a phone call or whatnot. And we really work on your site specific issues. Um, let's say you have hard to recycle materials and you just don't know what to do with them. We're going to help you figure that out. Then we have a private LinkedIn group where you can um, talk to the other enrollees in our program and really do brainstorming and, and try to just bounce ideas off of each other and find people in our program that are in your industry so that you guys can, can uh, you know, meet up and, and meet each other and, and really talk about the industry specific headaches that you have around waste management. 
Um, and then after the program is over, we uh, certify your uh, your um, your facility as a as a zero waste facility. So you get that stamp of approval, that thumbs up. <laughs> so if you're interested, of course, you can go to our website and sign up for that. And the last question for all of you is if we're not for zero waste, then how much waste are we for? And here's all my contact information. I am available um, you know, for a quick five minute question or if you need an hour long conversation, um, you know, let me know and I will make accommodations as best I can. Thank you so much, Stacey. That was brilliant. <laughs> Thanks. Um, I'm going to stop sharing my screen now. Perfect. Um, I, if anybody here has some questions, they can type them in the chat, but I have a couple of questions. Yes, go for it. Um, so, and I apologize in the middle of this, my, you know, there was some stuff going on in the background, so I may have missed it and I apologize. Um, but these things like misfit markets, mm -hmm. um, I've heard good things about them and I've heard people say it's kind of greenwashing. So I was wondering about your opinion. Um, I, I have not used them personally myself. Um, you know, we'll either go to the local farmer's market or we will um, hit up our, <clears throat> our local HEB, which is, you know, the, the Texas brand that everybody's so proud of. Um, that one, like uh, the number two best grocery store chain in the entire country. <laughs> uh, so they, the, the food waste issue is really a big deal whenever it comes to ugly fruits and vegetables, right? Mm -hmm. So if you've seen the Ugly Fruit and Vegetable Project, amazing. Uh, they do a really good job of just dispelling the myth that a bruise on an apple does not mean that the whole thing should be thrown away. Um, people are used to seeing everything stacked up in a nice little pyramid, you know, with the little thing on top and it's been lightly sprinkled with water and everything is glossy and that's just not agriculture. That's just not how agriculture works. Uh, and so, you know, whenever you really get down to it and you're talking to the farmers that bring this produce to your family's table, you know, they have to get rid of so much of the produce because it's not aesthetically pleasing to the eye when it's on the store shelf. So, you know, I, maybe some of their, their, you know, these, maybe some of their um, operational thing, you know, there, maybe some of their operations are a little bit greenwashed. I'm not sure, you know, checking into that. I know a friend, uh, you know, down the street that uses them, loves them, rants and raves about them. But, um, you know, I really hadn't heard about the greenwashing around that particular company. But the, what they're doing is providing a major service for agriculture growers. They're allowing them to take what would not have been sold and putting it into the market, into the hands of someone who desperately needs it or doesn't care about if it's got a nice waxy coat on it. Yeah. Uh, so there's, there's um, a lot to be said for the service that they're filling the gap for. Yeah, what I've heard is just that um, they claim that they're, they're taking food that would be uh, disposed of, but sometimes that food is not disposed of. It goes into things like applesauce or juice, you know, so it's not, so the, the argument I've heard is that they, um, their numbers are a little off because that food may not have been going into a landfill, and, but it might not have been going directly, you know, to be eaten. It would have been processed in some way. Um, right. Right. But again, that's just, you know, I haven't seen any real data on that. Mm -hmm. uh, my second question is about, um, there's one that's fairly local called Flash Food. I, don't, I think it might be a um, countrywide. Um, it's a an app where you, where grocery stores can link to it. Are you familiar with this? Um, um, no, but I've seen other apps like it that that make that connector. Yeah, and it lets you um, you know buy things that that they're trying to clearance out. Right. Um, you know, perishable things rather than like just the stuff that's on the rack with all the weird vitamins yeah. that they always seem to have <laughs> that are expiring. But that, I mean, um, this is huge for things like bakeries, right? Yeah. Your little small mom and pop bakery that, you know, you can only do so much and, you know, throwing bread at people. It, it's just, it, you know, there, it, 
it, having that really carb rich uh, diet and, and you, you'll go to, you know, food banks and you'll see, uh, gosh, just loads and loads and loads and boxes full of um, things like muffins and cupcakes and donuts and things that just, you don't want to really bring home to your family, but some people just don't have a choice. Yeah. right? They, they've got to keep something on the table. And then there's a very limited supply of like chicken breast or, right. you know, or ground beef or something like that. So it's, um, whatever, whatever they can do in order to, to make that connection, I'm all in favor for to help people who are maybe struggling financially, um, or, you know, and, and help the business get rid of that that material to make room for new stuff on their store shelves, but not only that, not having to put it into to the landfill trash, because again, that's the second time you pay for it. So if it can either be donated or if people can buy it at like 75% off, I'm all for it. Whatever we can do to feed those in need and keep it out of landfill and help the business not have to pay for it twice. It's a win-win-win in my, in my book. Yeah, now my question, is and I think all of that is fantastic. Um, but what I have seen is that sometimes they'll put they'll post um, fresh produce, you know, at a at a reduced rate, um, but then they they package it in plastic. Mm -hmm. You know, it wasn't packaged in plastic <laughs> on, on in the grocery department, but in order to go into this, you know, sell it in this app, they would put it in plastic, which I it just kind of astounds me. Um, do you see a reason for that or, um, you know, a way to get ar around it? Uh, well, consumers need to reach out to the company and say, why are you doing X, Y, and Z? I don't like it. It doesn't make sense. And it's an extra cost for your company. Why don't you have people bring their own bags and they can put whatever in, you know, whatever they're buying um, first. Uh, secondly, you have to think about not everybody has a car, so you might be on a bike, you might have to take the train, you might have to be on a bus, you know, you might have to throw your stuff in an Uber. <laughs> so, it, you know, the, I, I think that they're just trying to make it as convenient as possible for those who are coming pick up to pick up that reduced cost. And it's really what they have on hand. If they can switch to paper bags, you know, that can be put into your recycle bin. Um, or you can compost it, but there's, um, you know, just, I, I think that they're trying to make it as convenient as possible. If you don't have your own bags, or if you have to take public transportation, you know, you, you're not going to walk out of there with <laughs> an armful of, of oranges, right? right. You're, and juggling, um, you know, bananas and, and uh, frozen uh, popsicles, but whatever they, 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 whatever you go and buy, it needs to be carted out in a convenient manner. So I think that they're just thinking of those who may not have their own private transportation. Um, you know, that's something that we experienced here uh, in Texas as well. Um, in Austin, we had a, a checkout bag ordinance. So you mm -hmm. could no longer use your single use or have single use checkout bags, uh, plastic or paper, but some of the, the, you know, manufacturers and some of the um, grocery stores were like, well, what about out of towners that have never experienced a, a you know, kind of a bag ban like this? What do we do for those folks? They're not going to have their own bags and we need an emergency supply that we only use for, for those who really, really, really need it up front. So it's, it, it's just the convenience factor, I think is what they're really trying to get at, but you can definitely shoot them an email and say, you know, Hey, our, our organization wants to work with you to find a solution um, or produce your own bags, give it to them and then they can, <laughs> they can do a giveaway. Yeah. Help yeah. promote your organization. Why not? Well, this has all been fabulous. Um, I don't think we have any other questions right now. So any final parting words? All right. Um, so thank you again, Stacy. It was wonderful to hear you talk. Um, and everyone watching, have a wonderful evening. All right. Thanks, y'all. Thank you. Bye-bye. Texas. <laughs> Welcome. <laughs> Bye.